In this video, I'm talking about autism diagnosis and the truth behind why there's a sudden increase in the number of people being diagnosed with autism. All that plus more right at the end of the video. It's coming right up. Hey guys, welcome back to the Aspie World. My name is Dan. I have autism, ADHD, OCD, and dyslexia. Let me quickly video those all about this stuff. So if you're new around here and you'd like to learn more about those subjects, then make sure to hit the subscribe button by clicking that notification bell down below. Guys, what's going on? Welcome back to a video. Now, there was a, an article I read recently that was saying that autism diagnosis or the the rate of autism diagnosis has been increasing which has gone from seeing one in 60 people in the united states diagnosed with autism to one in 33 which is a bit crazy and that's only in the space of about three years but why is it now there is a profound reason for this and it's, it's not what people think now before we get into the juicy parts of this video i just want to say that i've been using this ono roller for about I don't know, two years now, and it's probably my favorite fidget gadget. Now, the honor roller is really, really cool. It just fits in your hand. It's a sleek kind of fidget toy that you could, like, secretly stim with. You could just have it in your hand and just, like, you know, play with it in your pocket or just have it in your hand and nobody really know what you're doing. It kind of looks like one of those, you know, those knuckle workout things. But it's really, really cool. Now, if you want to get a percentage off, I think I've got a 10% link for you down in the description down below to so check out the Ono. It takes you through to our website and then you can use my link to get a discount when you want to buy one. But I actually highly recommend this and it's probably my most favorite fidget toy. It always has been. It's awesome. Okay, let's go on with the video. Okay, so there's all kinds of reasons why people think that the rates of autism have increased. A lot of people think of things like the crazy stuff, like there's more vaccine damage or something like that, or, or um, there's more toxins and poison in the world, or bleach or some kind of government conspiracy cover-up all kinds of crazy nonsense but none of that is is the reason why and and it's very very simple if we look at the reasoning for autism diagnosis or how autism was diagnosed back in the day you're looking at people like um hans asperger leo kenner and these people were writing research papers in 1942 they weren't the most agenda up on like you know the the ins and outs of neurobiology and neurology and a lot of the stuff is missed out i mean for instance they used to say well, only boys had autism, which was a lot of cosplay. And then they'd say, oh, um, only children have autism, right? It's only present in children. And so what you had for, for many, many, many years is, is this notion that, you know, if somebody passes into adulthood, then they no longer are deserving of an autism diagnosis. And then, I mean, just getting rid of the, the majority of the population, females, right? Okay, well, females don't have autism. They can't have autism, blah, blah, blah. And so that kind of gets chucked. Off. And then you think like, wow, oh, okay, well, this doesn't make much sense. But when you fast forward to the future, now since about 2000 and, I don't know, 13, 2014, we've had an increase in people advocating for autism online since the advent of kind of social media, like, you know, here on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok, like you're watching right now, I'm able to put videos out explaining things about autism, showing you how, you know, my traits and characteristics, you know, I struggle with, or, or maybe this is how it's characterized, or this is how it presents itself in males versus females, and all this kind of stuff. You know, we're covering autism burnout, autism diagnosis process, which I'll get into in a minute, you know, how, how people actually go through diagnosis process now. And because of that, you have more people, more than ever, going, oh, I understand. And so maybe there are adults on the autism spectrum. So boom, instantly you have an increase in the amount of people in a population which have a potential to be diagnosed autistic. And then you come around and say, well, it's not just males, right? It's females too. Let's like not be about the bush here. That's the most wrong data that it's ever been published or produced. And then they say, okay, yeah, of course. And you got Lana Wing and um, Professor Baron Cowan and uh, people like, um, you know, Steve Silverman. And they're, they're all coming out with this uh, new updated data, uh, which shows how autism is presented in females, how autism is presented in males, what it's like young children versus adults and all this kind of stuff. And then people say, okay, yeah. And then you get the majority of the population who now can potentially be diagnosed autistic, which is the female population, right? And so we, where you've gone from having a very kind of low minority of people who are diagnosed autistic, the understanding of, of autism becomes a, lo a lot more larger. And then you have more diagnosis. Now, there's another component to this. When you're thinking about autism and you're thinking about people diagnosed on it, you have to also consider the lifespan of a person. So whereas, you know, people on the autism spectrum, typically, if you have high support needs, your average age of, you know, death would be around 30 to 40 years old. Now, the average age of death for a person with low support needs, so a person like myself on the autism spectrum, is between... 40 and 55 years old which is really sad and there's a number of reasons for that 
But if you think about it in, in the in the longer term, you know, as people live longer, autistic people will also live longer because it's just typically the capacity of, um, you know, better nutrition, better health care, better mental health care, better neurology understanding. And so the age of an autistic person will increase as in like the, you know, lifespan, which means also there's a potential that there's a bunch of people who are growing older. For instance, I interviewed somebody uh, on my podcast whose mother was 70 years old being diagnosed autistic, right? So there's an aging population that are still relevant to being diagnosed, which would have been left off before because of two reasons. One, they're dying in. Two, they would have been on there because they thought, oh, they're too old to be diagnosed autistic. Now, are you autistic watching this video or are you a carer of someone autistic watching this? I'd love to know. Pop it in a comment down below and just tell me which one because I love responding to every single comment I get and reading all of your awesome comments. Now, if you think about this, in the UK, we've gone from one in a hundred people to one in 98 people, right? Diagnosed autistic, round about that scale. But there used to be a ratio of three boys to one girl be diagnosed autistic, right? And so if you have one female, you have three males diagnosed autistic. But that's all changed. There was recently an article published, uh, and I did a video specifically on this as well, which I'll try and leave at the end of this video, where they were saying that there's actually probably potentially more females who are autistic than there are males, but quite a number so. And, and that makes more sense because, you know, technically and geographically and biologically, there are more females in the world than there are males in the world. I don't know why, but it's always been that way. And so that just begs the, the answer to the question, why on earth did we not think that females were autistic in the first place when they're probably the majority of the autistic community? Now, all of this, it comes down to the fact that, you know, where are we in the process of actually getting an autism diagnosis for people? Well, at the moment, because of this massive surge of increase, there's no global conspiracy of why autism is, you know, rapidly increasing in diagnostic, but there is an issue with the amount of people who are able to access those diagnosis process. So over here in the UK, you'd actually spend two years on a waiting list to be assessed by our national health service to be diagnosed autistic, right? Which is crazy. But then you could go privately to try and get an autism diagnosis private. But the problem with that is if you get prescribed any medication or any kind of checkups, that would all have to be privately paid for as well, where your national insurance wouldn't really cover it, which is a bit of a pain in the bum. And when you think about the USA, you, you've got to, you've got to battle with insurance companies. That, you know, do they take on people who want a diagnosis of autism? Or do you have to pay privately for it? And then the same thing applies. Will your health insurance cover your medication? You know, it's a, there's a whole thing. So what we're going to see once the backlog of this kind of like diagnosis process actually happens is you're going to see a radical increase again so that number of one in you know 33 that's going to come down to like one in 20 probably once you get around to it now there is a book called um neurotribes by steve silverman which discusses the ideas of neurotypes and neurophenotypes of the brain and how that kind of works and what we have to be very careful here and and, and this goes for, for any kind of condition is where, where we draw the line between saying it's just a cultural difference or a, a personality difference versus a neurological disorder that needs, you know, medical attention. And autism is, you know, a spectrum and it has profound difficulties in many people where, you know, you may not be able to actually verbally communicate. You may not be able to uh, use the bathroom on your own. You may need 24-7 support. But then you have other people like myself who will have social communication and emotional um, deregulation issues and will be on medication. But we can typically kind of, you know, set up our computer and use the bathroom and things like that. And so you then start opening up this whole kind of idea like, well, what if this other person just has a social anxiety disorder, it's categorized under the autism spectrum disorder, but they have no specific needs at all other than just kind of chill out and, you know, deal with the anxiety. You know, it, it, it kind of, you're walking a fine line between declassifying it as a disability or, or, a, or a potential profound disability that versus just something that is common occurrence in, in people, which is kind of a scary thought because there's so many people on the autism spectrum who will need help. This is kind of the reason why they changed the terminology from Asperger's syndrome and autism to just autism spectrum disorder, so that people who were diagnosed Asperger's who then had the diagnosis as the autism spectrum disorder could actually access the help and support for level one, two, and three autistic individuals. So if you start delegitimizing the, uh, the disability or the level of disability, you may actually tamper with the amount of support, help, and aid that the person needs in, to get, you know, because they're under this big umbrella now. It's a big topic of discussion, and I'd love to know your thoughts. Please give this video a like. It's factual information, really interesting. Share this video if you think it's going to help somebody understand autism. And check out the video next to me here. I think you're really going to enjoy it. I'll see you in the next one, guys. Peace.